Okay, and welcome back to Obcast. So today we want to talk about the approach to first trimester bleeding when there is both bleeding and shock. This is an uncommon presentation, but worth talking about because this is when decisions need to be uh, effective and fast. So if we consider the differential diagnosis for bleeding plus shock in early pregnancy, really we're talking about ectopic pregnancy and miscarriage. In this case, incomplete miscarriage. An incomplete miscarriage can cause shock via two mechanisms, hypovolemia from severe hemorrhage or cervical shock from cervical dilatation. Now, it is possible that other forms of shock can exist, such as a septic miscarriage or anaphylaxis to a medication, but really, in the patients that come to the emergency department, it's going to be an ectopic or a miscarriage. Now, what I'd like to propose is a rapid bedside ultrasound evaluation of these women based on skills that all emergency physicians uh, have mastered. So, when you're faced with a woman with PV bleeding and shock, the first question is, is there intra-abdominal free fluid on ultrasound? Now, if there is, and we can see a slither of hypoechoic fluid there in Morrison's pouch, this is likely to be an ectopic pregnancy causing intraperitoneal bleeding, and your goals are to resuscitate and facilitate as immediate as possible transfer to the operating theatre for salpingectomy. If there's not any intra-abdominal free fluid, then this is likely an incomplete miscarriage, and your priorities are one, do a quick speculum exam and look for to try and treat cervical shock, two, resuscitate, and then failing this, three, organize immediate operating theatre for suction evacuation. Now what we might do is talk about the management of these few conditions in a little bit more detail. So first of all, ectopic pregnancy. The goals here are resuscitation, and what I mean by that is minimize crystalloid infusion and give early packed red blood cells and consider massive transfusion protocol. And as I said, the early facilitation of the operating theater. So more important than many of your interventions will actually be getting on the phone and clearly explaining the urgency of the issue. In terms of miscarriage, we have the incomplete miscarriages that have caused cervical shock. The goal here is to do a speculum examination. Now, at, in some people, this might require some analgesia on top of a normal exam because you're going to be um, doing this a bit more quickly and you're going to be uh, potentially removing some products in the cervix. The goals here are to use sponge forceps, and if you wrap sponge forceps, uh, sorry, wrap a gauze around a set of sponge forceps, you actually wipe the products from the cervix just by moving the sponge forceps down um, across the external os, uh, or sometimes just by grasping any products that are visual visualized at the external os. I don't recommend uh, inserting the sponge forceps into the cervical canal. Um, I think that's just uh, not something you should be doing as an emergency practitioner. Now, the equipment you need to do a speculum examination in this setting are purely a set of gloves, a speculum with a light source, a set of sponge forceps and plenty of gauze. Now, in the incomplete miscarriages that are having uh, severe hemorrhage as the cause of their shock, again, like an ectopic pregnancy, a goals are to resuscitate with minimised uh, minimal crystalloid and early packed red cells, massive transfusion protocol, and then again, it's worthwhile doing a speculum exam to remove any products sitting in the cervix. Now, they may not be, in fact, causing cervical shock, but they may be making it a little bit more difficult for the cervix to close down. Again, in these people, the phone is one of the most important things, and you should be calling your obstetric or gynecological colleagues to get a emergent um, suction evacuation done. Now, if you're in a centre where this isn't possible or you're just looking for some interventions that might buy you time, uh, uterotonics can be helpful. So here, ergometrin 250 micrograms IV or misoprostol 1000 micrograms per rectum can be useful. And it's just important to note that oxytocin receptors aren't present in the uterus in first trimester. So even though, as we'll talk about, it's our first go-to agent in postpartum hemorrhage, it's of um, little to no use in first trimester bleeding.
Other options that you can do to facilitate some hemorrhage control are bimanual compression. Obviously, it's a far smaller uterus in this setting, or um, which is more difficult if for the uh, inexperienced to insert an uh, Foley catheter into the uterus and put uh, 80 mils of uh, water in a balloon to try and internally tamponade the bleeding. So I might summarize this again. Remember PV bleeding plus shock, the differentials are ectopic pregnancy and missed, uh, sorry, incomplete miscarriage. Um, and the two mechanisms that miscarriages can cause shock are via hypovolemia or cervical shock. In terms of the diagnostic approach, I think obviously history and examination is important, but utilizing our core bedside ultrasound skills can be useful. And it can also be helpful um, because these patients aren't suitable for formal ultrasonography. So it can give our inpatient colleagues a little bit more direction as to what initial operation to commence in the operating theatre. So in those with PV bleeding plus shock, question one, is there intra-abdominal free fluid? If there is, resuscitate, salpingectomy, this is probably an ectopic. If there's not, this is probably an incomplete miscarriage, speculum exam, resuscitate, theatre. Thanks very much for your time and thanks for listening to Obcast.